It's a new chapter. This chapter, we're talking about polymers. And for most of your life, you probably called these things plastics. So when I say plastics, we're also talking about polymers. That's the word that we use in material science. So what are polymers? They can be split into two categories. You've got your natural polymers and your synthetic polymers. And your natural polymers are things like plants, right? Wood, leaves, all of these things. These are examples of natural polymers. A cotton shirt, this is a natural polymer, right? It's made by nature and yet it's a polymeric material. So what's inside of that wood, for example? Well, 40% of wood is cellulose, right? Cellulose is an interesting polymer. It's a crystalline polymer, meaning it makes up long chains, right? It forms crystals because these long chains can form. And what are the chains made up of? The chains themselves are made up of these repeat units of that little building block, right? If you put these together like Legos, that's the building block. You can see it's a, it's a ring-like structure. It's got OH groups on the side, and it's got two of them. If you connect enough of those together, you get cellulose, right? And that's what a lot of what plants is. Cotton shirts are like 100% cellulose. It's almost 100% cellulose with cotton shirts, right? Also in wood, you've got things like lignin. Look at all these aromatic groups that are on here and hemicellulose. So natural polymers very often uh, aren't completely pure, right? They exist with many different materials all coming together to make natural polymers. On the other hand, you've got synthetic polymers. Synthetic polymers have only been around for not very long, that I, not very long at all, really since World War II, which is only a couple generations back, have we had uh, synthetic polymers, and yet they have completely revolutionize the world. Uh, look around you in your room. By the time you finish this chapter, you'll be able to point to all sorts of polymers that change the way that your life works because we've made them. Uh, and why? Why are they such dramatic changing materials? They've got awesome properties. They're very easy to process into lots of different shapes. They are inexpensive and they are versatile. You can make them do lots of different things, right? So here's a rough timeline of the polymers that we're going to cover in this chapter, right? Go way back. 1600 BC. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in more of the history of this particular natural rubber, we did a podcast on it in my uh, material science podcast called Materialism. Check it out if you want. So 1600 BC, there's evidence that ancient Mesoamericans were using natural rubber from the rubber tree to make things like bouncy balls, right? Now, it is not the rubber that we know and love today. We've gotten a lot better at it. And a key part of that process was Charles Goodyear. Like if you have Goodyear tires, this is the same Goodyear, right? Charles Goodyear, he discovered what's called vulcanization. We'll talk more about this this chapter. But it takes uh, natural rubber and turns it into a thermoset, right? That's in the 1800s, so way later. Okay? It wasn't until the early 1900s that we discovered Bakelite. This is the fully synthetic thermoset, and we'll talk about what thermoset means soon. And it wasn't until 1933 that polyethylene was discovered. It was not discovered in 1933. It was discovered in 1898 by a couple of Germans, but they didn't know what to do with it. And it was hard to make it very useful, and so they accidentally discovered it. And 35 years later, it was re-accidentally discovered in imperial chemical industries. And at that point, they figured out how to make it reproducibly. And really, this was the dawn of the synthetic polymer. They realized, holy smokes, this substance is pretty useful and we can now we know how to make it we can make all sorts of things out of it which led to in the world war ii era in particular as things industrialized 40s and 50s you started to see mass production of synthetic polymers in the 1941 you get polyethylene terephthalate at calico printers association this was licensed to dupont right uh, in 1954 you get polypropylene polypropylene is a huge ball and we use that for lots of stuff uh, in 1954 you get expanded polystyrene we have another word for that we call it styrofoam right that was dow chemical styrofoam is incredibly important uh, in the 70s we ended up with polyvinyl chloride and then you started getting conductive polymers. And nowadays, you know, I could, we could go on. They get more and more specialized with more and more cool things that they can do. So as we've been going through this list, I've said polyethylene, which hopefully you've seen before, HDPE or LDPE, if you've ever seen that, that's polyethylene. We've said Bakelite, which is like your grandma's old phone was made out of that from, you know, the, the old days. Um, you've got styrofoam, you've got polypropylene. Hopefully what you're realizing is that all these polymers, okay, even if we call them polymers, they've got very different properties, and that's because they have very different structures. And so as a material scientist, we're interested in relating property to structure. And that could be crystal structure, or in the case of polymers, maybe that's the structure of how these strands come together in polymers. We're going to dive into that in this chapter.